Good afternoon, Hilbert Hotel. This is Pete speaking. May I help you? <laughs> well, actually, sir, we do have guests currently in all our rooms. Well, no, no, that shouldn't be a problem, sir. Of course we can accommodate you. <laughs> all right, then. We'll see you shortly. Okay, bye-bye. Attention, guests. We kindly ask that you pack up your belongings and move into the room next door. Thank you for staying at the Gilbert Hotel. Pete. Huh? Pete, wake up. Huh? Pete. No, i sorry. I think I fell asleep there for a minute and was having that dream again where I work for Hilbert's Hotel. Do you have any idea what it's like to have infinitely many people angry with you all the time? I bet you were dreaming about this today because we were planning on talking about infinity in our new episode, Ad Infinitum. So let's jump right in. Okay, so Hilbert's Hotel isn't just a crazy dream I was having. It's a thought experiment introduced by David Hilbert in 1924. And one thing it shows us is that infinity does not behave the same way that regular numbers do. How so? Well, think about our sketch at the beginning. We imagined a hotel that was full. It had somebody in every room. There would be a sign out front in most hotels that said no vacancy. But Hilbert's Hotel is a hypothetical hotel with an infinite number of rooms. So it's got a room number zero, a room number one, a room number two, and so on ad infinitum. So when the guest calls and says, I would like a room for the night, even though there is somebody staying in each of those rooms, we can accommodate the guest by simply asking everyone to move to the room next door. So the person who's staying in room zero can move to room one, and the person in room one can move to room two, and so on. Sort of like a long line of dominoes going all the way out towards infinity. This opens up room zero for the new guest. Oh, okay. I see how that works. Right. And this strategy, of course, of moving everyone down one room definitely wouldn't work in a finite hotel. <laughs> A finite hotel? Well, right. I mean, you know, not not an infinite hotel. One that has sort of a definite number. Oh, like Motel 6. Dude, we're talking about hotels, not motels. I mean, it's not a <laughs> motel. It's <laughs> Pilbert's Grand Hotel. So in any case, if you have a finite number of rooms in your hotel, you can't just move everyone down a room because what's going to happen to the person in the last room? Where do they go? Okay, so it doesn't work if you have a finite number of rooms, but, I mean, that seems obvious. Yeah, it does, of course. But nonetheless, mathematicians have formalized this idea into a result which is known as the pigeonhole principle. Given positive integers m and n with m greater than n, if we take m objects and place them in n containers, then at least one container must contain more than one item. Okay, so to make sure I understand what you mean. So if a hotel with 100 rooms has a guest in each room and someone shows up at the front desk looking to stay the night, there's no way to accommodate them without doubling up in one of the rooms. Right, and you know, even if you try to move people around in some particularly clever way, like not just everybody moves down one, you get real clever with it, you just still can't make it work because at the end of the day, 101 is bigger than 100. So they're just not going to fit. Okay, but infinity works differently. So does that mean that the pigeonhole principle is false for Hilbert's Hotel? Well, it's, it's not false. It's just that the version we're talking about here applies only to finite sets. And of course, Hilbert's Hotel is modeling an infinite set. Okay, so what even are infinite sets? Well, would you believe me if I told you that an infinite set is a set that isn't finite? Would you believe me if I told you my level of dissatisfaction with that answer isn't finite? <laughs> I, I, You know, I would believe you, actually. <laughs> so <laughs> let's start with an example of an infinite set. So the set of natural numbers, which is the set 0, 1, 2, and so forth, is... Okay, so just to be clear, we're talking about 0 and then all of the positive whole numbers. Right. So no negatives in this case. Okay. And this is the most basic example of an infinite set. In, in fact, it's the only infinite set 
that is axiomatically guaranteed to exist. All of the other sets that are infinite can be derived from this one. But, well, actually, you know, do you remember our episode about zero? Yeah, yeah, of course I do. Our zero episode was our number one episode. <laughs> I mean, it was our very first episode, Much Ado About Nothing. Right, well, the axiom of infinity says that there exists a set that contains each of the sets that John von Neumann constructed for the natural numbers. And, of course, we spent a good deal of time going over that construction in our first episode. Right. So, okay, it, it seems pretty intuitive that the set of natural numbers is infinite. But now, how do we math up our intuition into infinity and beyond? All right, Buzz, listen up here. <laughs> Let's start with the definition of a finite set. So a set is said to be finite if we can put it into one-to-one -one correspondence with one of these sets that von Neumann used in his construction of the natural numbers. How about an example? Sure. So let's start with a simple set, the set containing A, B, and C. Well, we say that that set is finite because it corresponds to von Neumann's set 0, 1, and 2. So, for example, A could correspond to 0, B to 1, and C to 2. Yeah, yeah, but I'm, I'm still not sure what a one-to-one -one correspondence actually is. Sure, here's the definition. A one-to-one -one correspondence between a set X and a set Y is a method for partnering the elements of X with the elements of Y. And this partnering has to be done in such a way that different elements of X have different partners in Y. And also every element of Y does have to have a partner in X. I think I understood this more before you defined it. All right, so what, what if we use a real-world example? How about that? Okay, so you are an elementary school teacher, so can you think of some kind of one-to-one -one correspondence in the classroom that maybe involves students? All right, so if I understand what you're asking, I would need to be partnering the elements in two different sets with each other. And we're saying that one set is the set of all the students in the class, and then there'd have to be some other set to kind of match each student up with. Yeah, exactly. All right, so I, so I could say that the second set is the set of seats in the classroom. If I think about a teacher's seating chart, every student is assigned to one seat, and no two students are assigned to the same seat. Right, and there are no empty seats left over. And if a classroom didn't have enough seats, then at least one of the students wouldn't be partnered with a seat, or they'd have to share a seat with someone else and then we wouldn't have a one-to-one -one correspondence anymore. Yep. And if we have unused seats, well, then again, we wouldn't have a one-to-one -one correspondence because not every seat would be partnered with a student. So there's only a one-to-one -one correspondence if there's the exact same number of students as there are seats, and each student is assigned to a different seat, right? Right. You got it. So now here's the punchline. A set is infinite if it cannot be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with one of von Neumann's sets. So it really is true that a set is infinite if it's not finite. And it really is true that you love saying that. Shall, shall I go on ad nauseum? <laughs> Add something. <laughs> All right, so here's another idea that we can develop using the notion of a one-to-one -one correspondence. So you mentioned a moment ago that two sets that are in one-to-one -one correspondence must have exactly the same number of elements. And in your mind, when you're picturing the students and the seats, that's exactly right. Well, we're going to take that definition and lift it up into the world of infinite sets and use it as the definition of two infinite sets having the, quote, same number of elements. We want to use a technical term here. We say that two sets have the same cardinality if there exists a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. And this gives us a way to compare infinite sets to one another. Would we even need this to compare infinite sets? Wouldn't all infinite sets have the same cardinality as all other infinite sets? They all have an in infinite number of elements in them. Uh, let's come back to that, because I think you'll find the actual story a little surprising. Okay, so how does this bring us back to the pigeonhole principle and Hilbert's Hotel? Yeah, it does bring us back to the pigeonhole principle, and here's, here's why. So, in the finite case, 
we started off with two integers, one of which was bigger than the other. So 101 is bigger than 100. And we definitely cannot fit 101 guests into a hotel with 100 rooms. And that's because a set of 101 elements is bigger than a set with 100 elements. But for infinite sets, what we're saying is if you have infinitely many and you add one more, you haven't changed the size. It's not bigger to add one more. And so the pigeonhole principle still applies, but it needs to be couched in the language of cardinality. And so here, the truth is that an infinite set, given one additional element, doesn't get bigger. Its cardinality is the same. Well, that's just weird. But okay, I can see how the hotel can make room for an extra guest. It's kind of cool that the natural numbers have they kind of have room for one more. We'll leave the light on for you. Yeah, and I think, you know, people want to say things like infinity plus one is still infinity. And, you know, that's a little bit fast and loose, but that's kind of the idea that's going on here. All right, so let's move on to a another infinite set. Now I'm thinking not just of the natural numbers. Now let's consider the set of all integers, which also contains the negative numbers. Right. So that obviously would be twice as big as the set that contains the natural numbers. Ah, those two sets have the same size, actually. Wait, so the natural numbers, which is just zero and the positive whole numbers, is the same size as the integers, which is zero and the positive and negative whole numbers? That's right. They have the same cardinality. We, okay, but wait, wait, how could that, how could that be possible? If I make two lists, one for the natural numbers and one for the integers, the integer list would always be just about twice as long as the natural numbers list, right? The the natural numbers is going to be zero, one, two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera. And the integers list is going to be zero, one, and negative one, two, and negative two, three, and negative three, et cetera, et cetera. So wouldn't that show that there are twice as many integers as there are natural numbers? Well, you've come up with a particular way to sort of arrange them so that it looks like at every step, your your list of integers is roughly double the size of your list of natural numbers. But the definition for two sets having the same cardinality doesn't require every correspondence to be one-to-one, only that there is some correspondence that is. Kind of like how not everything you're saying makes any sense, just some of it does. <laughs> this <laughs> this actually does make sense. So just bear with me for a second, okay? Let's find an example then of a one-to-one correspondence between the integers and the natural numbers using Hilbert's hotel, right? We'll just imagine guests checking into a hotel and we'll see if we can do it. Okay. All right. So as we said earlier, the hotel has rooms numbered zero, one, two, and so on, right? So these rooms represent the set of natural numbers. All right, you with me? Yeah. And let's suppose that each one of them is occupied. So right now we've got somebody in all of the rooms. And then let's say it's like a really big soccer team shows up. And I'm thinking so big that in fact, the players with their jerseys, they're numbered negative one, negative two, negative three, and so on for all of them. Oh, wait, I know this team. I, I know this team. This is the negative Nellies. <laughs> yes, <it's>, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. The negative Nellies, they all need rooms to stay for the night, okay? So can the hotel accommodate the team? That's the question, right? And it turns out it can. Not only can it accommodate the team, but it also can accommodate all of the guests that are already staying in the hotel. Tell me how. Okay, so we're going to come up with a little scheme. Just like in the opening segment where we asked every guest to move down one room, we're going to do something like that, but it's a little more complicated. So here's what we'll do. First, let's rearrange the guests who are already in the hotel, and we'll do it this way. Whoever's in room zero, they're lucky. They get to stay where they are. Whoever's in room one moves to room two. Whoever's in room two moves to room four. Whoever's in room three goes to room six. So is everybody just multiplying their room number by two and then moving to that new room number? That's exactly right. And, All right. And now do you, do you agree that everybody who was in the hotel can still stay in the hotel just in a different room? Yes. Cool. But guess what we just did? We opened up all of the odd-numbered rooms. 
And that is an infinite set of rooms within the hotel that is now open. So we're just going to slide the soccer team right in there. So player negative one will go to room one. Player negative two will go to room three. Player negative three will go to room five and so on. Wow. It's pretty trippy, isn't it? Like you, you just sort of say, well, everybody double your room number. Now, of course, in the middle of the night, if you're in room, I don't know, <laughs> one billion, and you've got to haul yourself and maybe your whiny kids down to room two billion, you're not going to be happy about it. I hope there's a soda machine in the hallway between them. <laughs> so notice, by the way, that if we take all of this together, all of the people now in the hotel, right? We've got the original guests, and they numbered 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And we have the soccer players. They number negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and so on. So the sum totality of that set represents the integers. Every number in the set of integers is represented by either a soccer player or an original guest. And so we have the whole set there. And that whole set fit inside the hotel, which we already said corresponded just to the natural numbers. <laughs> okay, Mr. Math. So answer me this. Uh, it's Dr. Math, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Dr. Math. So answer me this. If we start off with infinitely many people in the hotel representing the set of natural numbers, and then infinitely more negative Nellies move in using the method that you just described. Aren't there now more people in the hotel than there were before the Nellies arrived? Oh, you know what? You totally didn't get me because no, they are. <laughs> No, because uh, I definitely had you there. Yeah, I know you thought you had me. No, it's because the sets, we can put them into a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? In fact, that's what we did. We didn't actually ask all of the guests to step outside and get in a giant line with all of the soccer players. But if we had, that giant lineup would represent the entirety of the integers. And by assigning them, by partnering everybody in this giant list with some room in the hotel, we have established a one-to-one -one correspondence between the integers and the natural numbers. Pretty sneaky, sis. Wow, you know what? That's cool. It, it's surprising because it, it, it definitely seems intuitively like there should be twice as many integers as natural numbers, right? Well, it is counterintuitive. And in fact, it's a relatively recent result. Nobody knew that these two infinite sets had the same size until sometime in the 1870s when mathematicians were beginning to formalize these ideas. And, and they started to notice there's something going on here that's different about these infinite sets. So it's a relatively recent result. Okay, so we started with the infinite set of natural numbers. Yep. And then we expanded that to include the integers, which somehow resulted in a set that's the same size as the one we started with. So I guess now we need to add in all the fractions or all the decimal numbers that are between the whole numbers to find a set that's actually bigger than the natural numbers, right? Wrong. <laughs> because actually, even if we throw in all of those rational numbers, so all of the fractions, both positive and negative, that fit in between the integers, we still have a set with the same size. It's got the same cardinality. Wait, what? There's a one-to-one -one correspondence. In fact, you can write it down without too much difficulty. So, oh, well, I'll tell you what. Let's put a reference in the show notes, and our listeners who are interested can go track that down. So you're saying that a soccer team whose players have fractions on their jerseys can all fit into this hotel, too. And after they do, <laughs> we still have a total set that's the same size as the one we started with. That's, that's right. In fact, if the hotel was completely booked and then this soccer team showed up, we could fit all of them in and keep our original guests at the same time. <laughs> all right. I, I think I see what's going on here. Every set of numbers has the same size. No, we don't. Nope. Nope. We're not going to say that because, in fact, it's not true that every set of numbers has the same size. I know we just said that the rational numbers and the integers and the natural numbers all have the same size, the same cardinality, and they do. But the set of real numbers is much, much bigger. Okay, wait a minute. Remind me and our listeners, what is the set of real numbers again? So it also includes the irrational numbers like 
square root of 2, and pi, and e minus 7 divided by the square root of the sine of 2. You get the point right here. All right, so now we're expanding to include all of the irrational numbers, which can't be expressed as the ratio of two integers. Yeah, exactly. So now, if a soccer team showed up with as many players as there are real numbers, say for every real number, somebody on the team has a jersey with that number on it, then there would just be no way to fit them all into the hotel. Are you saying that even though there are an infinite number of integers, there are somehow even more real numbers? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. And that is a very non-trivial fact. It certainly flies in the face of intuition, although our intuition sort of left the building as soon as the negative now is short. <laughs> I have not had any intuition working since you woke up from your dream. Okay, right. Yes, our intuition has been a little bit broken since I woke up, but you've got it right. The real numbers cannot be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers. There simply are too many of them. Okay, but there aren't so many of them that we can't accommodate them in a hotel with infinitely many rooms. Well, but Hilbert's hotel has infinitely many rooms, and we can't put them in there. We would need a bigger hotel. Bigger than infinity? Well, let me say this. The kind of infinity that is represented by the natural numbers, by Hilbert's hotel, is called countable infinity. And the kind of infinity represented by the real numbers is called uncountable infinity. And it's actually quite a bit bigger than countable infinity. How much bigger, though? Give me an example of what you're talking about. Okay, so what really makes everything bigger here is the presence of the irrational numbers. So just to put a fine point on this, let's say I got out a bag and I put in the bag all of the real numbers. And now I ask you, Noah, I want you to reach into the bag without looking, just swirl your hand around and grab out a number. So if you were to do that, the probability that you would pull out a rational number is zero. You just wouldn't do it. It just wouldn't. Zero. Zero. Oh, I get that you're saying that the probability that I would pull out a rational number is very, very low. But it can't be zero because there are some rational numbers in the bag, right? Well, there are. But let's compare it to something that's a little less exotic. So... Let's suppose that you're flipping coins, right? And I'm interested in having you flip heads 10 times in a row. Now, what's the probability of you doing that? That would be one half times one half times one half. It would be one half to the 10th. It would be one half to the 10th, right? That's a pretty small number. Um, and yes, it's possible that you could do that, but it's pretty unlikely, right? So picking a rational number out of this bag is harder than that. In fact, Picking a rational number out of this bag is harder than flipping heads one million times in a row. In fact, it's harder than flipping heads a billion times in a row. You're a lot more likely to flip heads a billion times in a row than you are to pull out a rational number from this bag. That's how few of them there are compared to the irrationals. I just want to make sure I understand this. So we're saying that the odds of pulling out a rational number are so astronomically small. But that's not the same as zero. What you just said is not the same as zero. Being astronomically small is not the same as being zero. And look, this is not intuitive or immediately accessible by any means. It relies on something called measure theory. But the probability can be quantified using the machinery of measure theory. And that probability is zero. The rational numbers are such a thin presence among the real numbers that they're almost ethereal. They're almost not there. But, you know, I can take any two numbers. Like, I can take 0.1 and 0.2, and in between them, there are infinitely many other rational numbers. There's 0 0.11, 0 0.12, 0 0.13, 0 0.14, and then I can go out to further decimal places. There's 0 0.1112 and 0 0.1113. There's infinitely many rational numbers in between any two given numbers that you look at. It's true. And nonetheless, between those same two numbers that you started with, there will also be infinitely many irrational numbers, and they will just overwhelm the rational numbers that are there. 
it's weird because there are infinitely many rational numbers and they cluster together. In the language of topology, we would say that they are dense in the real numbers. But what I'm saying here is that the irrationals are somehow denser. I think I see an example of someone that's being irrational and is denser. Okay. All right, I'm going to give you a chance to redeem yourself. First of all, I just want to make sure that it's clear to the listeners. I know that you're right. You know a lot more about this than I do, and I am just giving you a hard time for fun. <laughs> but, but here's your chance to redeem yourself. At the end of our last episode, we gave our listeners a puzzle, and we said that we would discuss it more on our next episode. So can you refresh your memory what that puzzle said? Yeah, so we have an explorer somewhere on the surface of Earth, and they go on a little journey. They walk a mile south, a mile east, and then a mile north to find themselves back at the exact spot where they started. And we wanted listeners to tell us, where did that explorer start from so that this journey is possible? That's right. And we also said that a lot of people have probably heard this one before and have heard that the answer is the North Pole. And yes, this is an answer that satisfies the terms of the problem. However, I think our listeners will be interested to know that there's another answer that works. Oh, do tell. If you head to the opposite side of the globe, almost to the South Pole, just a little bit north of the South Pole, in fact, it would be 0.16 miles north of the South Pole, you will get to a point where the latitude line that you are on describes a perfect one-mile circumference around the Earth. In other words, you will be just north enough of the South Pole that if you go east for a mile, you will go completely around that cross-section of the globe. So if you were one mile north of that line of latitude, in other words, if you were 1.16 miles north of the South Pole, you could head one mile south, which would take you to that magic line of latitude we were just talking about. Then you would go one mile east, which would take you all the way around that line and back to where you just were. And then when you go one mile north, you will end up in your original starting position. So there are two answers to this problem. Well, would you believe me if I told you that there's actually a lot more than that, that there are actually infinitely many answers? Yeah. Well, so first of all, if you are 1.16 miles north of the South Pole, you are standing on some point that itself is part of a circle of latitude. And if you were to start on any point on that circle, you would still go one mile south to hit what you called the magic circle. Then you could head a mile east to take yourself all the way around the magic circle and then head back north to the point that you started at, which is on this higher latitude. So I see what you're saying. So it's not just one point that's a mile north of this magic circle. Any point that's a mile north of that magic circle would satisfy this problem. Yes. And would you believe me if I told you there are actually infinitely many other solutions? So imagine now that you've got a different magic circle that is closer to the South Pole, whose circumference is half a mile. If you are one mile north of that smaller magic circle, then when you head south for a mile and walk one mile east, you will go around the smaller magic loop twice to come back. Oh, uh, to... you see where I'm going with this? And there's another magic circle that you can go around four quarter miles, miles and a quarter and so forth. And a 16th of a mile and a 32nd of a mile. Well, we don't have to be just paying attention to powers of two. There's one that's a seventh of a mile, and there's one that is a one thirty-ninth of a mile. And so you could end up traversing those circles many, many times. But it's fascinating that the one example that people know about is actually, in some ways, the geometrically least interesting point, right? The North Pole is very different from all of these Southern Hemisphere points that satisfy the puzzle. Right. So, Noah, I know that you arrived at the answer 0 0.16 miles north of the South Pole using Google Earth, right? I did. I used the measurement tool to draw a circle around the South Pole that had a circumference of one mile. And when I did that, 
I saw that the radius of that circle was 0.16 miles. So that's how I knew that 0.16 miles from the South Pole is where that magic circle lies. That's totally cool. I did it a different way. I actually solved this using spherical geometry and by playing around with the azimuth angle, which is the spherical angle which measures relationship to the z-axis, I was able to find that magic circle by, it turns out, looking for an arc length segment of length 1 over 2 pi, which is, in fact, the 0.16 value that you came up with using the map. So, so you got cool. the same answer. I got the same answer. Interesting. By the way, we did mention on our last episode that we would give a shout out to the listener who provided us with a correct answer other than the North Pole first. And we did have a listener write in and would like to congratulate listener Kevin for coming up with the answer 1.16 miles north of the South Pole. So congratulations, Kevin. Pete, would you like to tell our listeners how they can reach us if they have questions or suggestions for future episode topics? Yeah, you know I love to tell our listeners this information. Yes, of course. So you can reach us at Gmail. Our email address is mathclubpodcast at gmail.com. And on Twitter, our handle is at mathclubpodcast. Well, Pete, I would like to bestow upon you infinite thanks for our a uh, very scintillating and interesting conversation. It was scintillating. All right, I'll take that. That's, that's pretty good. And you know what they say at Hilbert's Hotel? We'll leave the lights. We'll leave all the lights. No, that's too many lights to leave yeah. on for you. Can you imagine the electric bill at an infinite hotel? <laughs> don't, don't leave the light on for us. We'll find our own way. <laughs> See you later. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.